Hello everybody and uh, welcome to today's lecture. So today we're going to be talking about fission. So as you might recall, fission is when um, an atom splits apart, right? To, to, to fish is to, to cut or to split. So, um, and this typically happens for species that are greater um, uh, or for nuclides with greater than an A number of 50. Right, so with A uh, greater than 50. Um, and uh, as you'll recall, right, the, the binding energy uh, per nucleon, uh, as we discussed earlier, is something that goes down uh, per for um, as a function of A for, for increasing A. Um, once you get past this uh, 50 point. So um, if this is our Be per A, or <laughs> binding energy per nucleon, and then down here we have our A number, right? The curve for this looks something like uh, for, low for lo low number of nuclides, it goes up till you hit about um, uh, iron and lead, and then it goes back down for things that are more in the uranium. Uh, so this is hydrogen, etc. cetera, uh, hydrogen, lithium, helium, um, and then this are, these are more the uraniums, and this is the, uh, uh, the uh, irons. So you can go look at this up in the book, and this 50 crossover, this point right about at 50 is where we uh, start decreasing again for increasing A. So, um, what we can do then is uh, define uh, or we'll call E sub crit uh, oops uh, sorry it's kind of annoying call E sub crit um, the critical energy needed in the nucleus uh, for the nucleus to fission. Um, uh, and then, so thus, thus, If the nucleus whew, bad day for spelling has greater than this energy, um, the nuclide may fission imme immediately. Okay, um, and so if we uh, we're going to go back to our board here, right? So we'll just define a uh, few the steps here. So, um, right? So a neutron comes in uh, and attaches itself to uh, a nuclide with atomic mass A, and then after that point, um, what we have is a single compound nucleus of mass A plus one, and then if the energy of the nucleus is greater than E crit, uh, we'll get fission, which, you know, results in about, in two smaller um, particles uh, being created, plus some neutrons and gamma rays, uh, etc. So um, over here we have fission. So that's the process. Okay. Um, so neutron uh, induced uh, fission can occur if the neutron provides enough energy such that this compound nucleus is greater than the critical energy. Um, uh, it now, uh, if the incident neutron 
uh, and neutron can be zero energy. So that means it has no velocity, the neutron just, or minimal velocity in the, the, they, uh, the, the, a compound nucleus is formed. Um, the initial uh, nuclide, so our, whatever our nuclide is, is called fissile. Right, so uh, if a zero energy neutron can induce a fission, then that's a, a, a fissile nuclide. Um, and examples, an example of this is U-235, okay? So, um, and then on the other hand, if the incident uh, neutron has to have non-zero uh, kinetic energy, then the nuclide is called, this gets the name fissionable. Um, for example, U238, right? So this means that there's some energy of above zero uh, where if the neutron has less than that amount of energy, less than this critical energy, less than this energy, then the neutron or then the nuclide won't fission. Like you have to have some, uh, there has to be some momentum, some energy, some velocity there to cause the atom to split apart. Basically, the nucleus needs to get to a certain excited state uh, for that to happen. So, um, oops. Uh, if we want to look at critical energies in MeV, so let's go ahead um, and uh, take a couple examples here. So I think I need four columns maybe. Uh, so let's look at the uh, nuclide, um, and then uh, ecrit. Uh, oops, I'm gonna get this up here. And then uh, the binding energy of, and then we'll also have a category uh, column here. So then, I think this is how I do it. Uh, uh, tables. It's going to be a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, that almost looks right. Uh, uh, so let's say uh, first we have U-235 um, and then the critical energy of U-235 is 5.75. Um, and the binding energy is 0 0.015. Uh, for that, let's give this another space there. And then the category um, here is uh, uh, fissile. Okay. Does that look right? Yes, look at that table, pretty nice. Okay, <laughs> uh, so, um, so let's go through. So U-236, um, the critical energy is 4.6, uh, zero. And 
the binding energy of this nuclide is 6.6 .6, and this is um, uh, also fissile uh, oh no uh, I think this is fissionable oops we need more spaces okay all right then for u238 another important nuclide this is uh, 5.85 um, and uh, the binding energy is 0. 0.0 Zero one uh, nine uh, or one nine five, um, and this is uh, fissile. Okay. Um, or no, sorry. U two thirty eight is uh, fissionable. And then U239, which isn't around for very long, this is, has 5.5 .5, uh, and a binding energy of 4.9. Um, uh, and um, this is uh, oop, U239. And this is also uh, fissionable. Or no, this is uh, this is fissile. Sorry. And then so that's that for the uraniums. Uh, the plutonium two thirty nine has. Uh, f also a 5.5 uh, critical energy, but a 0 0.012 um, a binding energy in his fissile, and the plutonium 240 is uh, 4.0 and it has a binding energy of 6.4 and it's uh, oops, visionable. Okay, so that's our situation here. Um, and so, uh, uh, so let me go back here. So um, uh, so a uh, nuclide is fissile again when uh, the binding energy of the compound nucleus, so of A plus 1, uh, or I'll, I'll say the binding energy of um, uh, if our nucleus is X, then of X A plus 1 minus uh, the critical energy E crit is uh, uh, minus the critical energy of that same nuclide. So X uh, A plus one, if this is greater than zero, then it's fissile. 
So, and then similarly, it is fissionable uh, when this same expression is less than zero. Um, so, uh, sorry, so actually, with this table, I can't actually tell you all this information, right? Because what you need is the compound nucleus. So we should get rid of this um, and get rid of this one. And that's why I had it in my notes like that. But I believe the previous versions are the same, right? So what you can do is you can say, um, well, U235, uh, the binding energy uh, for U236, right, the compound nucleus, minus the E crit, this is greater than zero. So U235 is then fissile. Um, uh, on the other hand, for U238, 4.9 minus 5.5 is less than zero, right? So it's negative 0 0.6, and so this is uh, fissionable. All right. All right. So another term here to be aware of um, is that um, uh, is uh, we call. Let me do this. We call the nuclide. Uh, we call the, a nuclide with atomic mass A uh, fertile when um, the compound nucleus, A plus 1, uh, is fissionable. Um, so this is because, oops, let me get rid of that parentheses. <laughs> that made it in there. Um, so this is because the excess energy needed uh, by the fi fissionable nuclides uh, for, the, for that excess energy, um, it, they don't actually make great fuels on their own, right? So um, they, they typically can be converted into something else. Um, and so this extra energy to drive the fission has to come from somewhere. Uh, and fissile nuclides are sufficient, whereas on the other hand, fissile nuclides are sufficient on their own, right? So you can start and keep a chain reaction with fissile nuclides, but with fertile nuclides, you have to have these, um, you have to have uh, absorbent ne neutron first. So, um, so, uh, oops. Uh, I misspelled fissionable. <laughs> uh, oops. Accidentally here. Um, so basically, if you have to absorb a neutron and then you become a fissionable nuclide, then that original nuclide is called fertile. And there are some examples of this that we'll uh, we'll talk about. So, or that are are famous, like the thorium cycle. The thorium fuel cycle is kind of based on that idea. Uh, Okay, so from here, what we can do is we can define what we call the capture to fission ratio. So, um, and unfortunately, uh, this also gets the symbol alpha, um, but we're gonna say that alpha is a function of energy. Um, and so uh, in particular, alpha, is equal to um, the microscopic uh, capture cross-section, so sigma gamma, uh, divided by the microscopic uh, fission cross-section, sigma sub f, okay? Um, and this is basically how likely a neutron will be to be absorbed rather than to fission, right? So it's the ratio of these two things is, tells you uh, the relative likelihood. Um, it's, 
not expressed in a somewhat different term. Or it's expressed as, um, you know, capture versus vision, though. So um, if this number is greater than one, you're much more likely to be captured. And if this number is less than one, you're, you're more likely to vision. OK? Um, so along with this, call new um, the number of neutrons release released per fission. Okay, so this is something that you have to go to the uh, the nuclear data to find out, and we'll say that new is also um, is a slow function of energy uh, where um, you typically get an extra neutron per uh, 6 to 7 MeV, right? So basically what this is saying is you get a certain number of neutrons released per fission, and the faster your incident neutron is going, right? So the more kinetic energy your, your incident neutron has, um, you get uh, more rough, more neutrons, roughly at the rate of for every six or seven MeV uh, faster your incident neutron is going, you get more uh, neutrons that come out of the fission, um, and so. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can approximate this as um, with the following function. Uh, well, yeah, you can approximate this as sort of a simple linear th function um, with an initial thermal uh, in incident energy. OK, so given that, <laughs> um, you can also also define Eta, the um, as the number of neutrons released per neutron absorbed. Right. Okay. So this is another important quantity, um, and eta is simply a function of these terms that we've already defined. So you can say that eta is equal to uh, the number of neutrons released per fission nu times uh, the fission cross section, um, so sigma sub f, divided by the total of the, or by, by the absorption cross section, so sigma sub a. Um, and um, you'll recall that we, oops. Uh, have defined the absorption cross section as uh, the gamma cross section plus the sigma cross or the fission cross section. So that's just sigma of f. Um, so if you reduce this, this is equal to, um, and you go back to our alpha definition, you can express this eta as nu divided by 1 plus uh, our alpha, or our capture to fission ratio. OK? Um, so that's uh, pretty useful. And then if we happen to have a collection of I nuclides, so for a collection of I uh, nuclides um, in a material, then our eta value is equal to uh, 1 divided by uh, the macroscopic uh, cross-section, right? Uh, the macroscopic absorption cross-section of the whole material um, times the sum 
for i, for little i and big i, of uh, the uh, the number of neutrons released per fission uh, for each individual nuclide times its each nuclide's macroscopic uh, fission cross section sigma sub f comma little i. Okay, so that's how we express that, um, and we you should note that we need to use the number the macroscopic cross sections here because this is all a function of the number density of each of, the relative number density of each of those nuclides. So when we define this these terms up above, we could get away with the microscopic ones because the number densities cancel for a single nuclide. But when you've got this mixture, then uh, you need to uh, account for that somehow. Okay. So um, uh, let's just take a look at some representative values. So say for thermal values, uh, thermal values for the above. So this is when the neutrons are in thermodynamic equilibrium with the material that they're in. Um, and we're going to need another four four columns here so we'll say nuclide um, and then we'll list the capture to fission ratio um, and the uh, neutrons released per fission new and uh, the uh, the neutrons released per neutrons absorbed eta. Okay, uh, so making a table. And so um, for U235, for example. Um, alpha is 0 0.169, um, so that says that we're more likely to fission than to capture a neutron. Um, and nu is 2.418, so that says that uh, for every fission, uh, so for every fission we of a U-235 atom, we actually get um, we get this extra we get 2.418 neutrons. Um, and uh, the neutrons released per neutron absorbed is 2.068. So that means for every neutron that uh, uh, a nuclide absorbs, we get two neutrons back. So that's very useful for defining things like, or, or for, that, that's the critical piece here for having a chain reaction is that we can we get more neutrons every time we fission an atom okay so let's look at these values for something like plutonium 239 which is also uh, pretty cool and important so our capture to fission ratio is 0 0.362 um, which uh, again, also means that we're more likely to fission than to capture the neutron. Um, and then the neutrons that we get are, per fission, are 2.871. So we get slightly more neutrons released per fission. Um, and similarly, we get uh, 2.018 uh, neutrons uh, released per neutron absorbed in the fuel. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so that's sort of how these things work. So w w if we, when we get these, uh, we get more neutrons than we release, and that's pretty, uh, and that allows us to have this uh, chain reaction occur, or chain reactions and reactors to occur. Um, however, not all neutrons actually come out immediately. So there's a distinction between what we'll call prompt neutrons and 
delayed neutrons. Okay, so say that most, about 99% uh, of fission neutrons that are released um, are created as a direct result of the fission, okay? Or of the fission itself. Right, so that means that a neutron comes in and splits the atom, and then the, of those neutrons that are born, it's, it's directly because the fission occurred. Uh, so, however small but significant fraction um, come as a direct result of the decays from fission products. Right, so fission happens, there are these two other pieces that are both likely very radioactive, and so those decay, and sometimes those decay by neutron emission. Um, such as, a good example of this, is bromine 87. Okay. Um, so, uh, just to put some definitions out here, uh, uh, we'll call prompt neutrons. Uh, are neutrons that come from fission immediately. And what we mean is this, that this is on the time scale of femtoseconds, so it's very quick. Um, and then uh, delayed neutrons are neutrons that come a bit later, which can be seconds or sometimes even minutes. Uh, uh, so it, it can be quite a bit later. Um, and as I said, the fraction of the nucle we'll, we'll, we'll have a special name for this. So um, the fraction of delayed neutrons is gets the the label beta again I'm sorry and this as we said above is approximately 0.1% right so 99% of the neutrons are prompt but the fraction of delayed neutrons is a, is about uh, 1% um, furthermore we can split this into um, uh, we can split this beta up into um, uh, I different groups Oops. Uh, which are each which each have their own characteristic calf life right so uh, so we'll say split uh, um, beta I groups each with their own stick half lives and thus decay constants lambda sub little i comma beta sub little i, uh, such that um, right, so the sum of all of these has to be, so uh, beta without the subscript is just equal to the sum of all the other ones, so for i in big I of beta i. So right, all of the 
all the little fractions have to sum up to beta, okay? Um, and, oops. Uh, for most situations, i equals 6 is good enough. So we don't need many, we typically don't need to model uh, these delayed neutron groups with, well, with more than six independent groups. So um, if we go and look at uh, table 3.5, whoops, in the book, which is uh, the delayed neutron groups for um, uh, for U-235, right, what we'll see is uh, this has a total beta of equal to 0 0.0065, so uh, six and a half tenths of a percent, <laughs> which is a small number. Um, and so uh, we let's make a little table here again. Lots of tables today. Group, um, and then we'll say this is the half-life. So t sub uh, one half uh, in units of seconds, and. Um, We'll then have the beta sub i uh, for each of these groups. Uh, so now I'm going to need some space. Um, so for the first one, we'll call this just prompt. Uh, right, so the prompt group has a, a half-life of zero because um, it is uh, not one of these delayed neutron groups. And so the beta, the relative fraction is thus one minus the total beta, okay? Um, Oops, that didn't render like I wanted. Okay. One minus beta. For uh, I. Try to get this. Some more space. Uh, actually, I'll say this is unitless because it is. There we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so that's what happens for the prompt group. Um, for group one, um, this follows the convention that the the lower the group number, the larger the half-life. So this, or the large, yeah, the larger the half-life. So this has a half-life of 55.72 seconds, so almost a minute. Um, and the fraction of this is zero, or the beta i of this is 0 0.000215. Okay. And um, this is uh, the group two is twenty two point seven two seconds with zero zero point uh, one uh, one four two four um, uh, 
group three is has a half-life of uh, 6.22 seconds um, with a relative fraction of 0, 0, 0.12 seven four um, group four is has a relative half-life of two point uh, three zero seconds and a relative fraction of zero point um, zero point zero zero two five six eight Group five is um, uh, has a relative half life, or has a half life of six point, or sorry, zero point six one zero seconds, um, and is has a b sub i a beta sub i of zero point zero 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 uh, seven four eight. Seven, four, eight. And finally, group six looks like it has uh, a half-life of 0 0.230 0 seconds um, and a beta i of 0 0.000273. Uh, OK, so this is what our delayed neutron groups look, up, look like. So, um, the, so now the question that we might ask is what energy do these delayed neutron, do, do prompt new, to prompt neutrons uh, come out of the, come out at? Um, right, so we know we have these delayed neutrons and these prompt neutrons, um, but the, the prompt neutrons really drive the fission of the system, and so, uh, or the continued fission and the continued chain reaction. So, um, what energies are they coming out at? And the answer is they um, come out at a range of energies. Neutrons come out at a, or I should say, are born at a range energies uh, whose spectrum is empirically defined, right? So you have to go and measure these things. And the symbol we give for this is chi of E. So chi is a function of energy um, and uh, a good approximation oops Come on. for this is chi of e is equal to uh, 0 0.4453 times the exponential e to the negative 1.063 uh, times uh, the energy E this multiplied by the hyperbolic sine function of uh, the square root oops, of 2.29 uh, times the energy and this uh, has units of 1 over MeV because it's a distribution. Okay, um, so if we want to know what this looks like because it's kind of weird, um, uh, we can go, I'll sketch it out here for you. So there's some, uh, so we have our energy on this axis, so one, two, three, four, five. That one's wrong. So 
So if this is 6, um, and this is 1, and this is our energy um, in units of MeV, and over here we have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. Um, and then this is in unit, or this is chi of E. What we can see is that starting from 0 at about 0 0.2, uh, this rises up and then peaks at about 1.5 and then has a sort of exponential decay drop off. Um, until it gets to about uh, around 6 MeV. Um, okay, so neutrons tend to come out with around 1, 1.5 uh, MeV. Uh, that's the, what they're born at. Okay, and specifically, uh, chi is defined such that it integrates to 1. So we can say that the integral from z zero energy to uh, infinite energy of chi of E dE equals one. So this is a normalized uh, parameter. And thus, we know that um, if we wanna express what the average birth energy is, so uh, e bar, um, oops, this is equal to uh, the integral from zero to infinity of e times chi of e uh, dE, which happens to be equal to 1.98 uh, MeV. Okay? So uh, that is pretty awesome, right? So the average energy is about, is close to two. Um, all right. Now uh, for the final little topic, subtopic today, um, let's look at the energy released from fission, okay? So the purpose of neutron-induced fission is to release energy. Like this is why we throw neutrons at uh, at particles, ho hoping that they'll release energy. Um, uh, at least in a reactor, and in a reactor system, we want to recover that energy, um, and we use that recovered energy uh, to heat uh, other atoms, right? So we use it to heat a fluid, typically water, um, which we then use to turn a turbine and create electricity. That's the whole name of the game. So um, if we want to look at uh, table 3.6, this breaks down the energy from U235 in MeV, of course, per fission. And so it'll break down where the recoverable energy comes from. And so um, this is another good table to, to know about. So we'll call this energy recovered uh, uh, source of energy. Um, and then the energy that's emitted uh, versus um, what is recoverable, okay? Let's give ourselves a lot of space here. And so, um, the first one is fission product fragments. Uh, 
Um, almost so close. So about 100, 168 go, uh, um, MeVs worth of energy is emitted as fission product fragments. And what's recoverable from this is 168, right? So it goes into the kinetic energy of the particles uh, of the material around it, around it, and it's ionizing. Uh, it, it, it's uh, it, well, it, so most of these are ionized fission products, and so they uh, they uh, it goes into the heat of the material very quickly. Um, furthermore, we have fission product decay. Right, so this is when the, the fission products, since they're radioactive, they decay and they release more energy. Um, and so uh, there's various modes of decay, right? So let's look at those individually. So um, let's say we have beta decay to start with. Um, so beta decay releases about 8 MeV, um, of which 8 is recoverable because they're uh, all ionized. Let's see, does that look right? Yep. Maybe I should choose a star instead. Yeah. Oops. Well, it's doing something funny. Uh, I'll just do triple dash. There. Okay. Cool. So beta decay releases eight. Uh, right. Uh, photons also are emitted. So gamma particles come out. Um, gamma particles release about seven. Because they're so high energy, um, when they interact, they do a lot of uh, damage, or they uh, they move a lot around. So all of that's recoverable, um, uh, typically. Uh, uh, neutrons are also emitted, uh, of course, right? Because that's uh, some of our particles decay by neutron emission, or some of our. And there's about 12 MeV uh, wrapped up in the neutrons, uh, none of which is directly recoverable, right? So zero here. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, um, moving away from the f fission products, we also have uh, gammas that come from the fissioning nuclide itself. So we'll call these prompt gammas. And this again is about 7 MeV uh, on both ends. Um, uh, the uh, the then similarly we have our uh, neutrons uh, from fission and their kinetic energy uh, and this wrapped up in this is about 5 MeV of which 5 is recoverable right because those interact in the same in the same uh, uh, same uh, interaction uh, and then the capture gamma uh, is also something right so this is when the the, the species um, yeah, is that right yeah the capture uh, this is when the nuclide uh, captures a gamma and then, or captures emits a gamma ray and then uh, fissions later. And so this is um, uh, so this we say emits zero, uh, but we credit it with ha eventually producing three to twelve. Uh, uh, MeV since typically since that new nuclide is typically unstable, and so what we get oops, um, in total uh, 
is about 207 MeV emitted um, and 198 to 207 is recoverable. Um, so uh, this is, uh, we tend to average this out to be around 200 uh, MeV are released per fission that we actually end up getting back at the end of the day. And this changes slightly from nuclide to nuclide, but that's a pretty good approximation that we use in a lot of nuclear engineering applications. Okay, well, thank you so much, and see you again next time.